organizing for workers' power and for the struggle against racism and discrimination was what we did. I learned what it meant to represent somebody who really believes in power to the people. I think that we will all miss Pete and we've all lost a great deal with his passing. Pete Camerata was the most successful outsider in the Teamsters Union. Pete was not a local president. He was not a national vice president. Pete didn't hold any of the big offices. I'm glad that Labor Beat, for a moment, showed that interview where he was commenting on Ron Carey, Ron Carey's uh, platform. Pete held everyone to the highest standards. This was a, I don't want to call it a love-hate relationship, but Pete has had a love-hate relationship with more folks than you can imagine <laughs> because of holding folks to that higher standard. The 1989 consent decree was something that came from above. But democracy, and I was looking at the monument at Haymarket the other day, and democracy does not descend to the workers. The workers ascend to it. Pete did more in the heartland, Midwest, than probably any single person to make the consent decree real by promoting democracy. He had the black book. He had the address book. He knew who to call. He knew who to touch for money. He knew how to make local campaigns operate. He commanded more than most officers in the Midwest. He was motivated by justice more than anything else. I think that was the, uh, really at the soul of, the, of, of, of Pete. Uh, fame and position wasn't something he was interested in at all. And I think that's why uh, some of us used to refer to him as uh, no, re no retreat Pete. In the, I became president of Teamster 722 in 91 election for 92. And it was with the help of Pete. And I mean, he gave me encouragement. He, he uh, helped me with my flyers. He, he was like right there all the time. He, he was tireless about stuff. And I was running, you know, my slate was running, but he was like tireless in, in advice and, and how to do things. And I mean, I probably couldn't have done it without him. I'm just saying a few words today about my dear friend, Peter. Uh, I can, words like that can never be uh, sufficient, but I can tell you uh, what the man he was. We all know that and will always be. Uh, it was ironic that the first time I heard of Pete, actually saw him from a great distance, nearly 2,500 miles away, though I didn't know him, was watching the news. Uh, one strong, defiant voice in the midst of thousands of hacks. Uh, I, I forgot my own efforts. They seem minuscule compared to what this man was doing. and. Uh, to make a clean union in the face of corruption and the mob. And I said to myself, my God, are there are such, uh, such people, are there such men, are there such women, uh, do they exist? Uh, in this case, it was a man who was Peter. When he finally came to Boston, uh, it was a bonding at first sight. Uh, he, as well as I, not only uh, were proud to be a union, but Teamsters, Teamsters, pride, you, could, might, you might say. Our 38 years, uh, we dreamt the same dream, uh, a strong labor movement for a stronger America for working uh, people. Peter was cosmic, a, a shooting star as far as I'm concerned, uh, where there were teachers and families that were fighting for better schools. Uh, Peter was there. When a fellow teamster felt he or she was fighting a very lonely battle. Well, Peter, I know you're with us here. And again, my apologies for my sight giving out and my voice not as strong as I used to be. But remember this, like the gentleman said not too long ago, a few speakers passed, uh, don't mourn, organize and fight. Pete, as Joel said, was wide, widely read. He, he was, 
I guess what you call a working class intellectual in that sense. That is, a lot of things interested him. And you know, Pete, you could be on a, on a, a picket line. I remember uh, at once, one time he was on a, I think it was a, actually it wasn't a picket line, it was a, a defense line in front of an abortion uh, uh, providing, uh, Planned Parenthood, I think it was in, in Cincinnati. And so he would, he would be out there on that picket line, that defense line all day, and then you'd go, of course, that night, Pete was helping plan the party. And, and the next morning when you woke up, your shoes might be shine. And that was Pete. <laughs> Pete, that was, that, that, was the, that was the Peter that we knew. He was uh, my comrade. He, uh, I'll always remember him. Uh, the lessons that he taught us were invaluable of how you, how you, in a principled way, fought for the interests of those who had no power. I heard of Pete before this. He was kind of a legend with freight haulers and what he did and how he took on the old guard and how he's like fearless. But I never met him and I didn't know him to see him. So at this TDU convention, at a table I happened to be sitting at, I was listening to this guy talking to other Teamsters. And I'm thinking, man, this guy's, he knows what he's talking about. And he's like, smart and he, he understands the situation. It's like he's been there, done that. Turns out that was Pete. And from that day on, I kind of hung around him a little bit every time I went to any kind of TDU convention, learned from him. Uh, he taught me the inner workings of TDU and I was, I was very impressed with that. I was very impressed that he was down to earth, uh, patient with people, a great communicator and a for real teamster. At the 91 IBT convention, Pete had great insight at the, uh, as a carry strategist at the sessions we had. He uh, at first questioned Kerry if he was going to be a reformer or not. Turns out he was, uh, Kerry is a semi-reformer and uh, Pete hit that right on the head. But as things were going on, we were, we were very rare, we were the minority, I mean really minority at the convention. And uh, we had our spouses have rallies outside and at the Dolphin in Disneyland, there were a bunch of women who were holding the carry signs that were wives of the delegates and some guys who were the husbands of the delegates. Who, well, Shayla Garotis sent some goons out there to knock them all down. And my wife wanted to leave. And it was, I couldn't talk her into not leaving. And it was Pete who talked her into not leaving and talked to the other people and calmed them down. He had a a calming uh, ability about him. I was amazed. The other thing we did was there, um, my delegate, Dan Hanners and I, at the Kerry Convention, we didn't have those fancy stickers, those buttons. All we had was paper stickers. And underneath the stairwell, somebody carelessly left about several thousand Durham buttons. So we, <laughs> we, were, we dragged out those Durham buttons and figured, these are great buttons, and this carry sticker fits right on them. <laughs> and, and, for, and anyway, Pete happened to be wandering the halls, and he said, you can't do that. And then I, I told him what we're doing. He saw a great idea, and he, <laughs> and he helped me drag him up to the carry headquarters. So we had really nice buttons after that. You know, Pete had these uh, goons from the, the Teamsters Union blast, Brotherhood of Loyal American Strong Teamsters. I don't know if you, any of you remember this group, but, um, you know, they had, they had members who kept their jobs because they did the bidding of the BAs and the uh, um, administration of the Teamsters Union. Um, you know, they threatened people, they beat people up. Um, they intimidated teams, uh, TDU members at meetings, um, and we fought back against them. I mean, Pete always, um, even when he had people that were out to get him, and there were people that were out to get him, he would always, he went to hawk the uh, convoy dispatch all the time. When he ran for office in, TD, in the Teamsters Union, he didn't care that there were people that were out to get him. He was a brave man, he was an honest man. If he gave his word, it was good as gold. Back in Detroit, well, he was given the International Teamsters Hell, and they deserved it. 
I mean, Fitzsimmons uh, went to jail, and Bresser went to jail, and all those crooks went to jail, and, and Pete was, help, was very helpful in getting them exposed. And that, that union, international union, was really corrupt, and Pete was uh, a truck driver for Earl C. Smith, and he and Ken Path and some of the other guys uh, started TDU, and <clears throat> they were all about democracy, and power to the people, power to the rank and file. That's what his theme was throughout. Well, of course, he, he, uh, that was not uh, taken well by the lo local union, and they started proceedings to oust him. And they brought in a guy named McHenry who's, who brought charges against Pete for being a, uh, for conduct unbecoming a teamster. And what was that? Well, he was, <laughs> he was, he was too close to Ken Paff. Uh, he, he was tight with Steve Kindred. He was uh, part of the International Socialist Union, uh, Socialist Movement. He was red, he was pink, he was all these bad things. Pete uh, got ousted and uh, came to our office and uh, we prepared a lawsuit under what is known as the Landrum Griffin Act, which is free speech rights for workers, rank and file workers. Took that lawsuit over to the federal court. That law clerk, who's become a friend of mine, I've known him all these years, ran that paper to the judge's house that night, met with the judge, sat at the judge's um, table, and as my friend the clerk says, they can't do that. And he signed the temporary restraining order right then and there that night, and they kept him in the union. And then we had a, a big hearing uh, in court, and they brought in the international lawyers and all the other big guns, and that judge would not be deterred, and he threw the book at the union. Pete got back in the union and um, taught, taught those people a lesson. What I want to leave you guys with is, you know, what he left us with and so many people in this room to help inspire us as, as we carry it on and teach our children and do all that other stuff, um, his love of family. No matter how hard and how much the struggle needed him and how much he wanted to see Louie and everyone else at the TDU conventions, and he did that. He was always there for his family. And you see something in that video where he's in his truck with his nephew Jonathan in his lap, and you have to say to yourself, how did the dude pull that off on the clock, okay? And he was such a good organizer, and his lessons to us and to the men he worked with, because there was no women, no women at Earl C. Smith, know your contract, know your contract, work to rule. And if the boss steps on you, you step back. And he knew that contract so well, he timed his lunch hour. And due to seniority, that's something our mayor and our governor needs to hear, due to seniority, he could pick his loads and pick his routes. And he picked the route and load that sent him home to his mother's house for lunch. <laughs> and so he could drive to Harper Woods and see Kathy and his mom and his nephew. And he was bold riding down the street with his nephew in his truck. But that was real important for Pete and a lesson he tried to teach us. And the other lesson he tried to teach us, and he tried so hard to get out of bed and be on that bus with Jackson and Jesse and Christine and go to Springfield to fight for his pension. And the reason our family could do what we did all these years is because he retired with a Teamster pension that these guys fought for, and they fought hard for. <laughs> And if not for that, and if not for a really strong contract that the rank and file fought for, we wouldn't be here today, many of us. And those in the room who are my friends, who work for the other side and corporate lawyers, and you're here, and we welcome you. And you came from those humble beginnings. And we know it, and you know it. And your father was in the UAW, and Kathy's was president of the IBW in Detroit. So he wanted, he told me, when he was sick and when he couldn't talk anymore, he would whisper what he wanted and he would say, just don't forget. Don't forget what we stand for. And I think he's proud of all that. And what he did, and he, you know, he would always say to me and Jackson and Amy, walk the walk. You know, live as you speak. Be direct, express your feelings. And he would also say, you have to organize. And to organize, you have to be organized. And your personal life has to be organized to organize the rank and file. 
and Kath can speak to this and Amy too, his records were immaculate, whether he was on the job, uh, he was a dock steward and then a, a road steward for 20 years, 25 years, and he never lost a grievance. Uh, and part of the way he would do was he would organize the rank and file. And Jim Sweeney from Smith told a story at Detroit that just kind of left us full of that kind of love and organization. And Jim was an 18-year-old dock worker, and they got there, and the, the, the dock was unsafe. And it was 10 years later when I went. And the men were falling, getting injured, seriously injured. And so they called the BA, um, who was a little busy, had just come back from Vegas. And um, um, so Ed came over and he told the guys, there's nothing you could do. This is the way it is. This is the way work is. This is the way the docks are. This is the way the system is. And the men said, no, we, we don't. That's not, we're not going to do that. We're not, we're not going to work. There's no freight coming in this yard. There's no freight going out. And the BA said that was wrong. They couldn't do it. And so uh, the first 12 of them got fired for being insubordinate uh, to, to refusing an order to work. I think we've heard that before in the last few days, insubordinate. Uh, are you telling kids they can't take ISAT tests that are oppressive and wrong? And uh, so the BA came and he said, nothing we can do and I could maybe cut a deal to get some of you guys back to work, but people like Pete and stuff, you gotta go. And the guy said, no way. So as Sweeney tells it, and I wasn't there, uh, Pete picked the BA up by his necktie and he threw him out the gate. They came back and the boss said, okay, what do you want? And Pete said, not an inch of freight moves. And all 12 were reinstated with full back pay that day. And, and <laughs> it's, not, it's not something we can all do in every workplace, you know, per, particularly professional workplaces. Um, and I certainly don't want it in my workplace. But uh, um, I, I think the you know, the gift of P2 was not just to organize, but to have people do what they're good at. And to give to the movement for social justice, whether you're a dentist or a doctor or a lawyer or an organizer or you write for a newspaper, do what you're good at. Whether you take the minutes at the meeting or you get up in there and you tell the boss, no, this is not what we're going to put up with with a contract. And that's something Pete taught us uh, very often, and we'd come back and talk to him about the negotiations we were going through, and he would tell Jackson with firm agitation, you don't belong on that table anymore, you belong on the strike line. You guys got to strike, you got to strike, and we would say, no, 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 we have to negotiate. So when finally Jackson left the table and the strike began to be organized, he was very happy. Pete was a hell of a guy. Uh, I met him maybe three years ago. He's my... Uh, Stepfather, sorry, stepfather-in-law. Uh, when I met him, um, didn't know that the guy had cancer. I mean, he was so upbeat, you wouldn't know that he was sick. And you know, like everyone else has said, Pete fought to the end. Pete was a true fighter for everything that he did. From day-to-day -day operations, even when he was laying on his, in his sick bed, Pete was still taking phone calls, still fighting a good fight through the teams, just through any other union organizations that he was involved in. Pete was just that type of guy that made sure that at some way, shape, form, or fashion, he touched everyone. Fight the good fight and make sure that you're protecting your people. You know, I was fortunate to be one of Pete's caregivers as well. You know, many people would walk away from a situation like that. But Pete was that type of individual that would pull you closer whether you wanted to be there or not. <laughs> so, <laughs> I took that challenge. Um, Pete didn't have any natural children of his own, so he became that father figure to me. So, he instilled in me to make sure that no matter what, you always live the best that you can live and do the best that you can do and make sure that you keep loving each other.